We're going to talk about something that really is fun, and, that's, and that is the movement of our, of our uh, responsible area, our industry, uh, which is taking care of people with unscheduled care needs. I'm going to talk to you a couple times about this, once about how it relates to the emergency department and once uh, about how it relates to field care, and blending them together is, is really where we're moving in the future. During my medical school days 28 years ago, I became a firefighter, literally a volunteer firefighter in a community in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, over these last 28 years, I've worked both in the ED and in the field a lot. Uh, I find the interchange of experiences to be quite valuable. And uh, I know that there's a future coming ahead where frankly, we have to do that. I find with the list of problems that Rick delineated for us, we do too much complaining and too little on the way of solutions and that we look in the past a lot more rather than looking in the future, which is most other people uh, in this world are, are tasked to do now. And if you came down the hallway and looked at the rooms and the other, and the other meetings that are going on now, and you look a little bit at their agenda uh, as you walk by, you see things that are always talking about what's coming ahead. That's where we need to be. And that's why Sherry was nice enough to ask me to put this talk together. So <clears throat> the challenge uh, as it relates to uh, emergency department management and emergency department delivery of care um, is we have relatively rudimentary data uh, to operate off of. Uh, we, we need to know though from the data that we have available and what we know from our clinical practices how we can move this into the future. Uh, we need to explain what a regional accountable systems and, and the requirements of care in America and, that, and, and America going to the rest of the world. And it's nice to have somebody from the Southern Hemisphere here to uh, keep us honest. Uh, and then where do we develop and how do we, how do we share with each other the best practices? Uh, the issues right now are, are the economic climate and uh, everybody is able to reduce payment for services for us. And a couple of the numbers that are shared here, uh, I don't think many EDs can stay in business for a very long period of time at 87 bucks a patient um, and that we need to have enough money to keep those things available uh, and of course those big animals have to be available for anybody who has acute medical problems in your community um, so that really is a community resource and what has happened with a lot of other community resources is you have to decide how much the users are going to pay for it and how much is standby cost that the entire community is responsible for helping to fund uh, MTALA uh, is, uh, as Todd Taylor would say, it is the federal government's uh, national health policy right now, okay? And he'll, I'm sure, bring that up again tomorrow. But uh, MTALA basically says um, people will get care uh, at the hospital regardless of what their issue is. Uh, whether they're out of their, of their pills or whether they have major trauma, uh, you won't triage them out front and tell them they need to go somewhere else. As you listen to all the rhetoric um, in Washington, D.C., of course, the big guys fluff up there and, and say, we need access to care and all that. And all of you know there's a plenty of access to care. It's about who's going to pay for it. And, uh, and so MTALA has made that very clear. Uh, we have a, a great issue uh, with hospital closures that have occurred over the last 10 years. Now, what's going to happen over the next two or three years is going to be much more acute. And have any of you experienced a hospital closure in your community in the last couple of years? How about in the last 10? Everybody? Yeah, I, I, most everybody has in the last 10. Uh, and over the next couple of years, uh, we should expect that there will be more as the current round of financial pressures are, are going to hit the hospitals harder and harder. Uh, prevention and, and then this terrible tort climate. And of course, as all the reform issues are being discussed, would your, would your practice be much improved if the tort climate changed? Could you send more people home? Could you do dust tests? Uh, some of the doctors that Rick uh, speaks about there, some of my partners, uh, the ones who test the most are the ones that have been caught in a bad case from the past. And there's no, there's no telling them that they shouldn't be testing everybody, that everybody needs a CAT scan because they've had a bad case, they've been drugged through the mud, and there's nobody to tell them that they can't and shouldn't test everybody out the wazoo uh, moving into the future. So we have a terrible tort climate with no expectation that that's going to change. And that is not a discussion item with the current health care reform and is a major driver of costs for our health care system. Uh, and finally, there's, there's no reduction in demand for whatever the hazard is at your home, earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and ice storms and all that kind of stuff. Everybody has to be prepared. When all of you had to be prepared for H1N1 uh, over the last couple of months, did anybody come to you with a briefcase full of money and say, here's, here's some stuff to help take care of it? Of course not. Their expectation is you'll take care of it. 
Now, have we skidded through H1N1 in general with no damage? Absolutely, and it's, it is a weird, weird uh, pandemic uh, outbreak. It has defied all of the existing rules for pandemics, both for WHO and CDC. We had all these numbers, we had all of this person-to-person -person spread, and we've had no bump, no body count, if you want to be very blunt. Uh, and the body count that has occurred has been disturbing. It's been pediatrics and pregnant women, right? And, and you guys, no doubt, had to modify how you delivered care if you saw uh, pregnant women or if you saw uh, little children. Uh, our children's hospital in D.C., uh, average daily volumes this time of the year, about 180 patients per day, ramped up to see 400 per day. All of those things that Sherry showed you this morning, uh, they took their office space and converted it over to clinical space. <laughs> Tons of low acuity, and basically what they were doing was screening, and they did a really nice surge management process uh, by developing an intake algorithm, <laughs> a uh, set of instructions off of the CDC website, discharge instructions, and a medication pack and they put those things together and could see patients in their office space. Uh, do the little doctor or nurse thing, you know, put the, put the stethoscope on the chest, take the temperature, look at the kid's uh, symptoms. The, uh, the defining moment is picking out the ones that are sicker, okay? Uh, but they saw floods of patients uh, and they masked everybody up and, and uh, did all the, uh, the curtaining in the middle of the waiting room. Uh, anybody masked on this side, anybody with simple broken bones and other injuries on this side. Uh, and, and we're expected to do that and incur the costs and staff up, et cetera, uh, in response to any of these uh, demands for, for all hazards preparedness. Reference materials, uh, Institute of Medicine, Joint Commission, Brent Asplund's here, he'll talk about some stuff. HRQ uh, work that uh, Sherry is doing, uh, federal law, CDC, and the HAMPSIS. Uh, Joint Commission, um, I, I, I am a, I've told you guys this morning, I sit on the Joint Commission's Hospital uh, Physician or Professional Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, the Joint Commission has a very good insight into what goes on in the ED and a, and a real want to assist us in doing care better and into moving some responsibility for boarding and, and other big issues upstairs. Uh, and so you frankly have to make time with your uh, surveyor uh, who comes to do unannounced visits. Uh, let them look through the emergency department and make sure you're doing everything to comply with the, uh, with the standards that they have. Uh, but you have the opportunity also to discuss with them uh, the things that would make your job easier taking care of patients there. And as they go through the different methodologies and they want to know about patients who are boarded in the ED and they want to compare records from an ED boarded patient from a patient who went upstairs right away, uh, make sure that they know the difference and that your nurses aren't prepared to fill out medication uh, reconciliation forms that they do upstairs and, and ask people if they want pap smears and, and know how many steps they have going upstairs and all of that kind of stuff. So, so Joint Commission, please view as an asset uh, rather than a liability in how you work through things. Okay, again, uh, we have a system which is moving more towards outpatient care and you are the unfocused factory in your community. When we uh, look again, and you're gonna see this diagram every time I talk, because this is so very important, uh, that you understand you are the unscheduled care tier. And uh, we have the focus factories uh, in the community. They have a variety of names, surgery centers, uh, dialysis uh, clinics, uh, many of the uh, out, outpatient facilities for endoscopies, um, the, the, the uh, McDoctors kind of thing. And then the other new term that we have is the medical home, okay? Everybody heard medical homes? And, and we're gonna have medical homes and medical home providers uh, that are primary care based. Now we've been through this primary care thing before, haven't we? Primary care was gonna assume all care of the patient. They were gonna receive capitation and they were gonna dole out the money to the specialists. That worked really well, didn't it? Okay. Do you have any sense that this is gonna work better the second time around? Do you have any sense that really at home your primary care physicians really want responsibility for that kind of stuff? I don't think so. And uh, so we can talk about medical homes and we should talk under regional accountable systems uh, that we have much better systems of care available to take out to people's homes rather than moving them all over the place uh, in the community. Uh, but we can run through all these terms, but there's still a group of people here who are either gonna fall down on the sidewalk and, and bust their something 
Uh, we still have people that are going to suddenly get sick. It's getting harder and harder to differentiate acute coronary syndromes. And, and cardiology, do they want to see acute MIs in the office? Heck no. Go to the emergency department. Call 911. Uh, because they don't want to see that kind of emergency in their, in their offices. And then hospital-based care, and we're going to spend more time later on talking about the niches here and what goes on. And many of you have to fill these niches at your hospitals uh, because they don't have in-house coverage, and so the emergency physician's doing it. A woman who's delivering a baby urgently in, the, in L&D, the emergency physician's still going to go up there. Uh, you provide services to many of the admitted patients if you don't have hospitals. How many of you have hospitalists? Is that a great addition to your, to your care in the emergency department? No? Boy, in the communities I have been in, they are fabulous, fabulous. A great addition, and you almost work with them like partners. For those of you who haven't gotten to that sophisticated a system yet, you have something to look forward to. It really makes the work of getting people in the house a lot better. If you don't, and uh, we talked about some of this at lunch, uh, if you don't have hospitals available to admit the little old lady with the hip fracture, then it's five and six tortuous calls for the emergency physician to plead with somebody to admit the patient so the orthopedic surgeon will take them to the OR. Yes, sir. Well, I found this early on, they're, they're, they're really an asset, but when they get busy and stuff, they become just like everybody else. They don't want extra work, they don't want to okay. become obstructionists. Unless they're all by the same company, they get paid from the same place. Okay. It's, uh, the, uh, uh, the point that was made the, 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 in your practice in what city, can I ask? In St. Louis. St. Louis. The hospitalists uh, are okay for a while, but then they get a, a little stress overload, and as soon as they begin to get loaded up with patients, they, they become less easy to work with. Now, the sophisticated groups in other cities, and I fell into Atlanta not understanding Atlanta was a very sophisticated hospitalist community. The hospitalists love to get patients. They share their numbers and work with the CFO of the hospital. They have done the job that Rick talks about. They've gone upstairs. They've talked about decreased lengths of stay and margins that they produce. They go upstairs and, and arrange for subsidies for, for patients that they won't get paid for otherwise. Uh, and, they, and they do this all based on a really nice uh, model that they have put together for what hospitalists add uh, economically to the hospital and how much they they improve the work of the specialist physicians because uh, again the hospitalists will admit patients that the specialists are going to work on either in the OR or, or in some other way and the hospitalist makes their life much easier much as you should and and I participate in recruiting physicians to my small hospital uh, because orthopedics doesn't want to come into town uh, unless they know the emergency physicians know what they're doing and aren't going to wake them up every 15 minutes asking them what to do with a non-displaced fracture. And so hospitalists, as you develop a more sophisticated approach, I, I think you'll find your hospitals are a great addition to your practice. All right. Um, more users and more needs. Uh, again, you, you are the place where everybody with multi-system disease goes uh, and with unusual complaints. Um, you are... are um, a, a uh, kind of a product now of a changing practice. And, and I use chest pain as the example here. Uh, we used to have a lot of people with acute MIs present with chest pain. And now the presenting symptom complex for acute MIs is anything but chest pain. Uh, and primary care physicians don't know how to deal with that. People at home, if you're trying to educate people on what ACS is and when they should come back to the hospital, you have to throw out a very wide net. You do a very important service but you have to admit most of those patients, don't you? Because there's no good outpatient system. If you're talking about a regional accountable emergency system, probably the number one place where you'd have an effect in your community, if you look at admissions from almost any hospital's emergency department, uh, other than the pediatric ones, in a regular community or adult ED, the number one admission is rule out ACS, number one. And you do that because of tort issues, and uh, because there's no good, safe outpatient mechanism. Now, <clears throat> the next generation system will be, we've ruled them out in the ED based on some set of tests. Serum porcelains, uh, who knows what it will be, but we've, we've done a rule out. And you're gonna, you're gonna slap a T-shirt on them that's got a 80 lead monitor. That 80 lead monitor is gonna be tied to the cell phone that is tied to an OnStar style system. Okay, and, uh, and you're gonna say, go home or go back to whatever you're doing. 
uh, if your symptoms recur, if you have palpitation, et cetera, you have two mechanisms. One is there's an automated thing built into your cell phone uh, that just like OnStar with collision notification, if you suddenly go into VTAC, the system's not going to wait for you to call. It's going to automatically be, be uh, activated. They're going to know GPS-wise where that patient is, and the call's going to go right away to, to EMS, respond to X place because there's a patient there who's in VTAC. The other thing is if you have symptoms, you're going to push the red button, and then somebody's going to come up, this is OnStar, uh, and, it's going to, and they're going to say, uh, what, what is your problem? Uh, well, this is Mr. Smith. I was, I was just discharged from the emergency department. I began, to have, uh, I began to have chest discomfort again like I did when I was in the ED. Can you come back to the emergency department or, or go back there, or do you need me to send 911 to your location? Uh, and then they'll have that discussion many more patients will be able to go home with that system. And then, again, an 80-lead monitor T-shirt on them uh, looking for ST segment elevation or depression, uh, looking for rhythm changes, and then looking for any symptoms from the patient, an automatic link into the 911 system, uh, and or back to the emergency department as is appropriate. That's the future of accountable emergency systems and probably one of the few ways that we're going to be able to, in a protected environment, reduce the number of patients that we admit to the hospital. Short of that, we still are going to be admitting all those ACS patients. Uh, and short of that, we're going to have to continue to look. And as you write protocols, you're not going to write chest pain protocols anymore. They're ACS protocols. Uh, and, and they're going to have to talk about everything from weak and dizzy uh, through abdominal pains, through uh, sudden episodes of, uh, of diaphoresis, palpitations, and other things. So we have to send out these very broad nets and understand that people have atypical presentations of what typically was a common disease. All right, uh, we should have known that when prevention works uh, that more people were gonna stay alive. For those of you who missed this earlier, uh, our cardiac arrest numbers are going down in the field. They've gone down over 20 years. And what is left in the cardiac arrest population are people who are dead. And we get very little chance to resuscitate people in VFib anymore, and I view that as a marker of success. What it means uh, on the back end is that we have a growing number of people who are now alive in the community who didn't die earlier. And uh, when they stay alive, they present with things that are ED sensitive uh, and result in ED episodes of care. This was a patient. I pulled this from a record at the hospital that I had. And uh, I, I saw him here at age 68, okay, and when he had his GI bleed. And I, and I had gone back through his records uh, to pick out some things. And other than, the, other than age six and age 18, um, I, I thought this was a, a chart that demonstrated this exactly. Um, my point was at age six and some other old systems, uh, this, this person could have died in a house fire. But now we have a lot of fire prevention and he didn't die in a house fire. At age 18, uh, this gentleman probably got in an auto accident. And, and, and except for seat belts and, and uh, supplemental restraint systems and other things, he might have been dead at age 18 in a motor vehicle crash. But what I, he did have in his record, at age 48, uh, he developed exercise intolerance at work. And uh, who got him to go to the hospital? His wife said, you gotta go to the hospital. You got a bad family history. And, and, uh, and I, so I'm gonna take you to the hospital. So at age 48, he uh, went in to his physician. He got on the treadmill uh, and they said, uh, you passed, but you didn't do really well. And, uh, and so at age uh, 48, uh, they cathed him. Uh, he had some minimal disease. Uh, they put him on uh, aspirin and they put him on some beta blockers and he got to go on his way. That's, so that's his discharge at age 48. At age 50, he, um, he had some significant chest pain, okay? And uh, so they took him uh, into this emergency department. Uh, they shipped him off to the, uh, to the heart center. Uh, they they cathed him again two years later. Now he's got a critical lesion. They open him up, up and they open him up, uh, put a uh, stent in, and, uh, and then send him out. At age 52, um, he got spooked one evening because uh, he began to have that discomfort feeling in his chest. When they discharged him at age 50, they said, well, your next symptoms might be different. And so at age 52, he came back into the emergency department and fortunately wasn't having an event, and he was sent home. At age 54, he had an episode of shortness of breath, not pain, episode of acute shortness of breath. He comes in, and he bought his second stent. 
okay? So now he's got two stents in, and uh, he's back out on the streets. Subsequently, at age 58, he's still got an atherosclerotic process going in, and his cardiologist talked to him and said, you know, sir, we've, we've done all this stuff in your heart, but just so you know, one morning if you wake up and, and your speech is slurred and, and one side of your face isn't feeling right and, and you notice some problems in one side or the other, uh, what, what's his instruction? Come to the office? Is that going to be what they're saying? Of course not. It's call 911 and go to the emergency department. So at age 58, he has one of those, and, uh, and he, he got uh, his dose of aspirin increased. Fortunately, he didn't go on to have a full stroke. At age 60, he had a syncope episode, uh, and they, they recath him. His coronary arteries are okay, but now he's got a rhythm problem, and so they put a pacemaker in. At age 64, he has an episode of nausea, which is his third different presentation for now coronary artery disease, and he bought his third stent, okay? So three stents and a pacer, all right? And at age 68, I see him with a GI bleed. And, and finally, he, he at the high-dose aspirin therapy for his uh, cerebral vascular disease, um, he developed the GI complaint. Of course, that's another thing that his cardiologist would never say to come to the office for, right? If you're pooping really black, stinky stuff, that's not the time to come to the hospital, or come to my office, it's time to go to the hospital. So, so here's a guy who probably, in earlier days, at about age six, 50 or 52, would have had one of these episodes and would have been dead. And now he's 16 years out, um, and actually 20 years out from his initial event, and he's got three metal stents in, he's got a pacemaker in, he's on appropriate medical therapy, and his family's very grateful that he's alive, okay? And it's anything that happens to him now, he's had three different presentations of coronary artery disease, uh, and, and anything happens to him now, He's coming back in through your system. Do you have patients like this at your place? Of course, you're full of them. That's, that's a lot of your ED population. And of course, a lot of them require extensive workup in your ED before you can give an answer, right? And the guy still doesn't like being in the hospital. He's really appreciative that once he, he's been in the hospital, they did some great work on him to keep him alive till age 68. He probably doesn't appreciate that in the past he would have been dead. Uh, and that his wife really did him a great favor when she nagged him at age 48 uh, to go in and get checked when he developed exercise intolerance. And uh, the last two or three V-fib arrests I have seen missed that step or intentionally ignored it. Uh, and, and the nice story is uh, a guy who came in in Atlanta in the middle of, a, of the hot August weather in cardiac arrest, uh, but, but now, but now um, had been resuscitated on the second shock by EMS. Medics are just stunned. A age 50 years old in V-fib, they shock the guy the second time and get him back to a perfusing rhythm. He's not quite waking up yet, uh, but, but they, you know, they bagged him a little bit and then he started breathing on his own. They bring him in the ED. Hey doc, we got to save. It's, it's just great, you know, defibrillator twice. And we haven't seen one of those in years. Anybody here seen one of those? So the wife comes in and she says, oh, Oh, thank you for saving my husband. You know, he's been having chest pain terrible, uh, you know, for months, and he won't go see a doctor. He hasn't seen a doctor in 30 years, okay? So he violated all those rules uh, and, and is, a, is, a, a typic, is, a, uh, is not a typical patient in terms he's a, he's a complete medical system outlier. And so there's a guy that in the past was very common, age 50 and V-fib cardiac arrest. All right, and at every hospital discharge, what, what's the last thing that the nurse tells the patient? If you have any problems, go to the emergency department. Go to the emergency department. Go to the emergency department. All right. Okay, the emergency system then, older, sicker, medical. And by the way, again, every time a patient gets discharged from the hospital, the last instruction from the nurse is if you have any problems, anything drained, pulls out, you're, you get infected, uh, you can't get a hold of your doctor, whatever it is, call 911 or come back to the emergency department. So again, you're the, you're the, the place you're the system that allows these people to be discharged out of the hospital to begin with, and then, of course, to be able to go home and enjoy a little bit of their normal life. All right, Clockwork ED. I, I whizzed through it this morning, but has everybody seen the Clockwork ED and the flow diagrams that come off of it? Clockwork ED, very important, developed in 95. Uh, the advisory board uh, creates really, really nice uh, graphics and they develop the, the uh, graphics here, and this is still the flow process of, of patients through the hospital. Uh, the, the intake area has gotten the most work in our field since the Healthcare Advisory Board produced these materials. 
and the intake area has, has now become um, its own little animal in many of our emergency departments. And again, we've, we've imagined that we need to have a wall out front and the people need to stay out there uh, until, it, until you have space for them to come back here. And even when you have open beds available, uh, you, you want them out there until you're ready to see them. Does that make any sense? Really, it, it makes no sense at all. And now, when you see the film clips from Illinois, California, and New York City uh, of, of somebody dying in the waiting room, okay, um, it is no longer about civil malpractice implications. It's about criminal application. And prosecutors looking to say, we've always been disturbed by the fact that sick people are left out front. And I would guess that many of you sitting in this room have been out in the lobby area pumping on people's chests yourselves before. It just happened not to make the news, okay? Uh, like I have, it's a very disturbing thing and uh, sometimes revolves around our own little tussles within the staff about who should come back and who's not and who's a wall, if you've ever heard that term used, that can, can get 10% of the people to walk away uh, before they get to the back because they're probably not sick anyway. This is all really bad, bad, bad stuff. And the community is telling us this is not good. A and local prosecutors looking at all three of those cases, contemplating charges against the triage people, have led us down a new avenue here of saying we shouldn't have the wall there and we should be moving everybody that we can back into care by the way then getting them back out of care going home or upstairs as quickly as possible and the Joint Commission knows about this and CMS and the Office of the Inspector General that's the bad place to be okay the Office of the Inspector General state regulators and prosecutors uh, know about people in the waiting room who shouldn't be there okay all right so we need to change um, our productivity has got to increase uh, we need to look at things like FTE rules. Uh, we, we need to think through uh, who should be in the emergency department. Uh, and as I mentioned this morning, uh, oftentimes with a, with a debilitated multi-system disease population who's in the emergency department, what we oftentimes need more than anything else are really strong backs because we have to move people around because they can't move on their own. As we get into bigger and bigger patients, uh, it's also important that we, we have cranes in some of our emergency departments to assist us in moving around. And in DC Fire, we have to buy one of the great big um, uh, movement units with a tractor system that allows us to get people out of buildings and get, them, and get the stretcher into the back of the medic unit. Currently, our process, like many of your fire departments, is we use tarps. And we, and we use tarps to move people out of their buildings, sometimes having to cut the doors out in order to get them out. Uh, and I've told you that is one of our first steps towards d designing a regional accountable system because if the person's too large and their, and their disease process is a low acuity one, it is much simpler and avoids injury to other people if we simply take the treatment up to them. Uh, and so we send out a treatment team uh, out, to, uh, out to people's homes or apartments and, and uh, do some diagnostics there and do treatment there. And that, I'm telling you, is the first step that we will develop towards getting teams that go into nursing homes and into senior care facilities and into other places where it's much more expensive to move them. In your community, that relates to jail medicine uh, and, and penitentiary medicine if you have uh, any long-term incarceration facilities nearby. Uh, many of the group homes uh, and group homes oftentimes the citizens, the people that live there are, are much more comfortable there than they are if you put them in an ambulance and send them off to the emergency department. And I always feel sorry for a lot of our seniors. They get pulled out of their nursing home bed where they know what's going on and they, they know the people there and they love, uh, they love being there. And now you've jerked them out and put them in an ambulance, a rough ride to the hospital, they're sick. They don't want to be in your emergency department. You tell them you're going to do some tests and stuff. I want to go back to my bed. I want to go back to my bed. Why was I brought in here? It tells you we ain't doing the right things, okay? All right, uh, we, are, we are also in a position of doing some other things in relation to what we should be delivering to the community. During the inauguration uh, this year, uh, we, we uh, tuned up the uh, syndromic surveillance portion of our programs in DC. Syndromic surveillance uh, involves looking for patients with high risk symptoms uh, that would indicate a terrorist event, okay? Uh, all of you know about BioWatch over the big cities. They're big screens that are, that are uh, filtering air through 
uh, during the course of the day. They do, they've done this for years for allergens, and now they do it for anthrax, ricin, botulism toxin, and some other toxins. And so over the top of the cities in selected sites, they have these biowatch screens, and they use that to look for airborne diseases released by somebody in a crop duster over the top of important cities. Uh, we have a much better place uh, to screen for diseases in the community, and I believe that's your emergency departments. And doing syndromic surveillance, which many of you do off the top of your head, of course. You recognize, you see the second or third person who's through uh, your ED in a month, uh, or in, in a shift in the month of July, who's uh, puking and got bad diarrhea, and you go, something ain't right here. And so then you, maybe all three of them are still in your emergency department, and you go back through them and say, where have you been? What have you been doing? Uh, well, I, you know, I just got off a cruise ship. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier. Or I just went and ate at McDonald's. Well, now you got something on, on your hands. And so many of you do syndromic surveillance in your head. Uh, but what has to happen and is happening in these pilot programs is, is linking together providers. And, in, and for the most part, there's no better place than the emergency department to link together um, data that's coming out. Now, these programs unfortunately run hours to days later. Uh, what we need to have is a live program uh, that allows us almost minute by minute to look across the EDs in the community and see if something is happening that would make it uh, a, a, uh, a public health imperative for us to begin to act. I also believe that there will in the future uh, be another channel uh, beyond the weather channel uh, and it will deal with forecasts and it will have national forecasts regional forecasts and local forecasts for health services. And it will tell people, you know, today uh, in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, that snake bites are hot uh, and that it's time to stay away from wherever it is that snakes bite. Uh, and today in Chicago, it's a good day to fall on the ice. And uh, today in Washington, D.C., it's a good day to avoid your neighbors because H1N1 continues to propagate in the community. The National Weather Service does that, and they've done that for 160 years. They took mundane data, temperatures, wind direction, dew points, and, and cloud observations, and made them into forecasts. Do you use the forecast all the time? I'm already dreading my Wednesday trip back home because supposedly in Chicago the weather's going to be awful, and I don't want to be in O'Hare for a night. And, uh, and I believe we need the, the health channel um, to, to tell us about health care forecasts and to be able to reliably let us get information out whether it's very quickly, hey, we've got a GI outbreak uh, in Georgetown, which is what we had recently, uh, and they were worried that it was a foodborne and they had already implicated one restaurant in town. Uh, fortunately, our public health director didn't buy it and it was, in fact, a norovirus outbreak. Uh, but it could easily have been anything. It could have gone back to the Tylenol cases and uh, public health uh, in Chicago was scrutinized uh, for the heat wave that came through and uh, told the EDs in particular they did a terrible job. They should have recognized the early onset of heat-related illness and that they let a lot of people die because the emergency department didn't raise the red flag. That's the kind of stuff we don't need. That's the kind of information that our communities do need. And there's pilot programs already in place trying to do that. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the hospital interface with the emergency department. Uh, let's say again there's a community to serve. Let's say that in the smallest community hospitals, and some of you practice, how many of you practice in an isolated small city or small town, all alone emergency department and hospital? Just a couple of you, okay? Is your practice different? Do you guys know what diversion is? You can, unless you have somebody nearby. And in the places that I have been, it's wonderful. You're not allowed to divert because there's nowhere to divert to. The next hospital is 30. Oh, you worked here, okay. Um, the, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And a lot of times in those community hospitals, uh, the, the nurse supervisor or the CNO knows that the ED can't close and that the staff there is, is, is maxed out. And therefore, when things get busy, uh, they send down staff from upstairs. They help you move patients around or take things upstairs. If they hear that the bus has just rolled on the interstate, they send a whole bunch of staff down. It's really a wonderful place. If anything, in the big cities where we have multiple hospitals, we have shirked our responsibilities. And we've, oh, there's somebody else who will take care of that. Let's just divert them, okay? And uh, so 
And, and when we focus on flow, it's really the community hospitals that have been leading this for years because they know they can't close. They can't shut the doors down and that the ED needs to be offloaded or there's a backup problem and the CEO doesn't want to have that to happen. Why? Because the next time he goes to any civic event, somebody's going to tell him about it. It's darn ED. One night, it, you know, they, they closed and there was, you know, something happened, but the hospital still should have been open and I'm darn mad at you, the CEO, and the neighbors come and complain and all that kind of stuff. CEO doesn't want anything to do with that and the CNO doesn't want anything to do with that. So they let the, they let the ED flow the way that it should and not get backed up with borders. Uh, and, and no matter what we do, somewhere in your community has got to be the site for sick people uh, who have acute presentations of disease uh, to come in. At the community hospital, I, I talked to you about a medical mall. And uh, the medical mall talks about retail health care and about uh, around the hospital you build programs to get durable medical equipment, sports and rehab products. You need crutches, a walker, a cane, all that kind of stuff. They have a shop set up there by the hospital to do it. And a really nice setup <coughs> is, uh, is where you have uh, you know, the ambulatory entrance to the hospital. The ED is a featured part of that, but then that's also the drop-off part uh, and, uh, and the waiting area for outpatient x-ray, outpatient surgery, outpatient lab. Uh, they have social service office that's, uh, that's there. They have a pharmacy that's there. They have a durable medical equipment office that's there. So you have essentially an outpatient mall arrayed around that corner of the building or that part of the campus. Then they uh, oftentimes will put in a, a home health operation. And again, if that office is somewhere close to you or accessible to you, you can then set up visiting nurses out of the emergency department. You can set up home oxygen or nebulizers or IV infusion pumps or whatever you need to be able to send people home. And in a small community, the doctors are all bought into that. The primary care physicians oftentimes know how to use that. This, this is a very important model in a lot of small communities, small cities that have a single hospital. And moving towards this model is a very efficient one, uh, using the hospital as, as the center focus of care. For inpatients, um, another important axis, and depending on where you work, 15 to 30 or 35 percent of patients uh, that you see get admitted to the hospital. And I, I want to make you very clear, the evolving axis is patient, emergency department, hospitalist, and the hospitalist is assisted by interventionalists, pharmacists, or specialty consultants. Uh, they get discharge and case management, which may start in the emergency department, uh, and then they go back to primary care. The inpatient need, if you will, you have one little, little f flow focus that's through the ICUs or surgery. And generally, those are the sickest patients that you see that are, that are in need of going uh, immediately to one of the critical care areas. Uh, what we make the heaviest use of is, is whatever the telemetry step down advanced care unit is. And in and, and most EDs, everyone here, the, the, the place that you admit most frequently from the ED to is the telemetry or advanced care unit. Would that be a fair assumption? And so that's a really important focus area for you to work with and a really important area that you can't get congested or you can't get people out of the emergency department. And a few patients that we, that we admit to the hospital go to regular med surge unit. Have any of you spent any time on a med surge floor recently? It's a problem, isn't it? Have, have, do you really like the care that gets delivered up there? Anybody? It's a, pretty, it's a pretty sparse place, okay? And, uh, and without belaboring this, my mom uh, got real sick. I'd admitted to a med surge unit. My daughter did in both of their cases in very different hospitals. My wife ended up starting the IV on both of them. Uh, it really is a desert of healthcare. Uh, if both of them, they tried to avoid getting them through the emergency department, so somebody did a direct admission on them. Uh, my youngest daughter is a great case. She has a peritonsillar abscess uh, after mono. And, uh, and so the pediatrician says, direct admit. So they send her upstairs to a med surge floor. The nurses don't want anything to do with starting an IV on her. So my wife, who's a, who's a nurse, says, if you'll just leave that little IV uh, cart right next to the bed and you walk out for a couple minutes, I will, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be glad to take care of anything that you don't want to do. She starts her IV. Uh, and then, and then here's, a, here's a girl, uh, 18 years of age, who's puking against a peritonsillar abscess, okay? 
Uh, is there anti any anti-emetic medicine that's going to be administered to this girl? Well, without my wife's intervention, it would have been eight hours to her first dose. Now, she's got a big mass that's pressing up against her posterior pharynx and causing her to, to, to vomit and be nauseated. And on a med surge floor, they, they, they simply aren't plugged into getting stuff done immediately. It was a miserable experience, and it was downhill from there. All right? And just so you know, when you write Q4 vital signs, on anybody who's going to go upstairs, that means they do one vital sign an hour, okay? To make sure that somebody can walk in once an hour to wake the patient up and do one vital sign. So they come in with a blood pressure thing at 1 a.m. and wake the patient up to do a blood pressure. They come in at 2 a.m. to do, to do a, 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 a temperature on them. Uh, they come in at 3 a.m. to do a pulse, uh, pulse oximeter reading on because they don't want to stand long enough to do, to do a hand done pulse. Uh, and, and that's med surge. And I'll tell you, after those two experiences, it makes me cringe about admitting people up to med surge units. And I spend a lot more time at the bedside offering people, you know, if this is a marginal med surge admission, I'll talk to the family a little bit and say, you know, your mom's exhausted already. And uh, if she gets admitted to the hospital, I, I uh, you know, there's, there's these things that can happen. Maybe that's unfair of me based on my, my personal experiences. Uh, but just so if you haven't been up there recently, you understand what goes on sometimes in the outpatient units, and it's not a really friendly experience upstairs. Uh, the best care that I saw received out of the emergency department in all of these cases was by hospice. And hospice has built a program now that's based on patient needs, and it's based on good communication, and it's based on what, what do you want to make you more comfortable. Uh, and so hospice care is, I think, a really good model for us to develop on the emergency department side. It's good communications, it's patient comfort, it's patient safety, and it's about a predictable outcome. Uh, one more thing I wanted to do here, and that is uh, some of you are involved, and in how many of you have CDUs? Clinical decision units? Okay, not very many. Uh, the CDU is becoming a way to avoid some of this and where some emergency departments and emergency physicians have said, you know, we, we really are facing a problem getting people upstairs, and clinical decision units allow the ED to stay in charge uh, of patients uh, and allow uh, you to do a lot of rapid fire admissions through an area that is under the control of the emergency department. So the foci of uh, hospital care has become L&D for women's services, surgery for heart care, cardiology for heart care, subspecialty care for something that your house special, cancer, ENT, um, urology, uh, et cetera. Uh, and for those of you who do mental health and, and mental health units, this kind of head care. Uh, and so the ED, again, is expected to be able to serve any of these specialty lines that are coming through. When we pull this together in how we design and, f and, and practice in the ED, uh, what we have to have is enough beds uh, for incoming patients, a greeting area, the universal treating rooms, the CDU pods that function on the back end. Uh, Beaumont I talked about earlier, uh, they see 300 patients a day. They have a very low walkaway rate. They have a 75 bed emergency department and they have 66 CDU beds arrayed around the ED and they open and close them uh, based on census. The entire hospital census usually runs about 95% of beds uh, and the way that they have effectively uh, been able to continue caring for patients as they have a place to, for people to move to for short-term care, for 23-hour care, and that is their CDUs. Uh, and so if you want a really effective model of how the ED controls its practice and is able to handle a good deal of the low acuity admissions, uh, it is through the CDUs. We talked about, uh, about a greeting area that functions as a flow-through. And uh, I got to tell you that in the EDs that have EMTs or paramedics that are part of the, of the greeting process, they're very good at lifting, moving, sorting uh, people sick, not sick, and assist the nurses out front in, uh, in being able to process people very quickly. Uh, the next advent is, is uh, kiosks and where people can swipe themselves or sign themselves in. Many of you who have revisit patients probably practice like I do, when you're gonna send out a burn who you wanna see the next day or a, another MRSA abscess that you're gonna to need to see in 24 hours, you hand them their little card and tell them, here, take this with you. And when you come, or hand them one of their stickers, 
And you say, when you come back tomorrow to be seen again, make sure that you bring this in. And then at least registration will have your name and a medical record number. And they'll know that you were here yesterday and in fact, you know, are coming back in for a room recheck. And, uh, and so there's some ways that we can improve this. And I've seen a couple of the EDs now that are doing kiosk um, uh, registration processes and letting people guide their own care is a, is a great idea. The ED wraparound is, is uh, this uh, system again, and for community hospitals in particular, this is a very valuable thing. And within the DC hospitals, uh, we, have, we have tight physical spaces, oftentimes too small to see the volumes that they're seeing. If we do a build out around the emergency department and link these together, this is another system that is the future of emergency care. And these front end ED wraparounds can be linked to a central resource area and, uh, and in DC, for example, where we're very concerned about terrorist events or radiologic events that are, that are unseen, if all of a sudden the, the central monitoring system uh, saw a whole bunch of people flocking into the emergency departments around town with a similar set of symptoms and all of them were setting off the radiation detectors, then immediately we know we've got a system-wide problem. This, is, this has got to be coming at some point. And for those of you in the smallest hospitals, a lot of times they will array the community's disaster supplies and these new caches that they're purchasing uh, with some of the disaster funds. They'll put them in a building, facility, garage, or something that's close to the emergency department. Uh, future mobile diagnostics, mobile therapy, coordinated care, uh, good, good patient care and significant cost savings. Uh, the clinical example I went through is, is sending home those patients with ACS presentations. Another, another piece to this is the, uh, is the record, and, and, I, and I mocked up uh, for one of our information system providers a, a, an efficient record, and boy, if you, could even, if you could even send the patient home with something that looked like this. So you have, you have a picture, you have anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, potential problems, and what you did in today's workup. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a consistent way of, of uh, sharing information? If you had old EKGs and old cath reports and, and EP lab studies and other things. So the take home uh, for the future of emergency care is that we have a very important niche we fill in the community and in the American health system and in the international health system. Number two, prevention works. And when prevention works, it changes patient populations. Number three, we owe it to our staff to want to work in the EDs in the future. That means we've got to solve problems now, we've got to take good care of patients, and we've got to find solutions to really critical areas like the mental health burden in the communities and like our growing ACS uh, issues and problems. And that finally, solutions we should share amongst each other uh, and in order to build the best practices that we need. We really don't even have a literature that allows us to share that now. Uh, but move forward steps are there. My last talk of the day will be about numbers, and I'll fill the data points in here uh, with some, some trending data that we have from the Benchmarking Alliance. Thanks for the opportunity to speak.